So I'm really excited and also very humble about being able to present for such a distinguished audience. Um, and uh, my presentation is probably a little bit different from what you've seen so far. So, so if the other presentations was about principles for designing car engines in general, I'm going to take you on a ride in a car with one specific engine, which obviously I think runs quite fine. And that is the die credit system, which is on blockchain. This is crypto. And uh, this is created by MegaDAO, or what we call the Mega Team. We are one of the oldest projects on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and what really is the purpose of everything we're doing is really to provide more equal access to the finance system, no matter whether you are a small company, no matter whether you are unbanked, or whether you are a big corporation. So that really is what is driving us and motivating us. And we're not here to revolutionize and replace. We're here to evol have evolution and enhancement. That's really our goal. So what I'm trying to take you through, depending on the time, is really, first of all, touch upon how blockchain enables financial applications with, obviously, our system as the example. Then I'll give uh, a few examples from, from the actual world of how our DAI stablecoin is used in applications then dive a little deeper into how it works. It is complex when you haven't really wrapped your head around it, so I will also be here afterwards for further questions. And if time permits, I'll also talk a little bit about the role of tokenized uh, real-world assets in the system, and then conclude. So, um, you know, if, if we say this is fintech, I come from the tech side, and I've been working with IT for more than, than 30 years, so in that sense, I'm older than the internet. And I saw how the internet really generated a lot of value. And why did the internet generate a lot of value? That was due to the disintermediation. Suddenly, a lot of buyers and sellers could connect directly, a lot of middlemen that didn't really add value in this new paradigm, disappeared. But what did the internet not give us? Programmable money. And that's what blockchain can give us, together with the distributed immutable ledger, which means that we actually can have all our transactions recorded and make sure that they are there. We have the transparency that also means that everybody who is either part of the system or for a public blockchain, everybody in the world can audit what's going on. And then for this blockchain that's called Ethereum, we also have the concept of smart contracts, which really is just pieces of code that can be embedded into these, this blockchain. And that means that you can actually have autonomous code that can automate tasks, that can make sure that you actually can run and have systems that actually can act on their own without anybody, per se, governing them. So why haven't we seen uh, a lot of new revolutionary applications now we have these capabilities? Well, I think the speaker before and other speakers really kind of hammered it in. Why not? That's because cryptocurrencies are volatile. This is uh, Ethereum, which is the main currency on, on the Ethereum blockchain, um, over some days in, in February this year. And obviously, you can you appreciate that no one really wants to have applications where you don't know, even in the time it takes to register the transaction on the blockchain, how much the exchange rates, for example, towards the dollar is going to change. So obviously, it hasn't really been attractive to create real financial applications due to this volatility. That's what we're addressing with what we call the DAI stablecoin. We launched what we call the, um, the beta version December last year, and it has been running ever since now, and for, oops, for all that time, it has kept its peg to the dollar over almost a year now. So, that really opens for creating a lot of exciting applications. And let me take you through the very basic concepts behind how we generate 
the stablecoin or how the stablecoin is, is generated because it's not us generating it and uh, talk about how you can use it. So what we have here on the left is these smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. So that's an autonomous system that has from the real world some inputs about what the prices are on, on certain pieces of assets. And then we have people that can be ordinary citizens, it can be companies. What they can go and do is they can take and deposit some collateral into this system. And in the, in the current instantiation, that collateral is ETH, the cryptocurrency ETH, which then, due to the price feed, can get a dollar value in that system. Based on that, you, the, you, the user can then generate an amount of these stable coins. And there, there always has to be more collateral. In the, in the case of ETH, there has to be at least 150% the value of what you're generating. So make sure that there's always coverage for whatever has been issued here. Due to the volatility, uh, well, excuse me my English, but that, uh, that is 150%. In the, in the system we're going to launch next year, there will be multi-collateral, and we have, for example, from Singapore, tokenized gold. That will be a lot more stable, so there perhaps it's just 105% you need to over collateralize to get it. So then why, why would somebody want to do that? Well, they are not giving up the ownership of the collateral they're depositing. They're just getting some liquidity without having to, to part from it. And then they can go on and use it for whatever they, they want to use it for. It could be as a store value. Uh, it, it can also be used as a unit of account or media of exchange, depending on what your needs are. For example, we see our users in South America, they use it very much as a store value, whereas in Europe, uh, it's, it's mostly a medium of exchange. At some point in time, what, what you basically are doing here is, is getting a loan. We're obviously not calling it a loan because this is different from what a loan means in a regulatory sense. But at some point in time when you don't need or where you want to have your collateral freed because perhaps it's gone up in value or you need it for something else, then you simply pay back the die together with a small stability fee. And that fee goes to actually maintain the system and, uh, and also in, in the next version we're launching, there will actually also be a, 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 an interest on the DAI that's out in circulation, so that you will actually, even if you hold DAI, you will also get what we call a savings rate uh, on that. Now, there are two types of users in this system. There are the generators of the DAI, and there are the users of the DAI. The users of the DAI are the ones that seek stability and simply has a coin that they know always will be worth one dollar. Whereas the ones that are generating the DAI, they have to make sure that the collateral they have deposited for it always keeps this over collateralization. So in case, for example, that the, uh, the price on ease is falling sharply, they either have to deposit more or they have to pay back some of the DAI. And if, that, if they don't succeed to do that, uh, and, and the amount that, that backs, backs up the DAI falls below 150%, then the system automatically sells off the collateral to cover the outstanding debt in DAI. And then once, once it covered what's needed, to, uh, to pay for the outstanding DAI, the rest of the collateral is, is for the user uh, to, to, uh, to withdraw anyway. So that's basically how it works. Uh, so it's, it's like Airbnb. It provides liquidity for people who also are willing to accept this, accept this risk about taking care of or monitoring their position and it creates stability for everyone who wants to use this. So it, it's like, you know, Airbnb, somebody rents out their apartment and somebody wants to rent it. Uh, so there are different, uh, different values in that. And what is really important is there is no counterparty here. It's an autonomous system, 
So it's only the user that yeah, has themselves as a counterparty, so to speak. And there, it's, it's decentralized. There's no way where one single authority or someone else can close down the system because it's out on the blockchain. No single point of failure. Okay, um, so what are some business applications where DAI is used? Uh, the, the very obvious one is, is remittance, where it's, uh, again, you simply can send, uh, send money via the blockchain instead of having to go through bank transfers. Trade finance is also really an area where there is a lot of intermediaries and there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity to actually remove some overhead where, where it can be used for settlement uh, and, and actually also some of the, the uh, trade assets can be used uh, to, to put into the system to generate uh, credit from. Uh, another example is, again, uh, normally when you go and you, you borrow stuff, you end up, can end up in situations where there are several counterparties where each of these counterparties can actually come back and demand that you pay at, at any point in time. You can get away with that here. And then also getting more transparent accounting. I don't know how many of you have heard of triple entry accounting, but that is something that blockchain also enables, which really, again, means that you cannot, as you can with a double book accounting, cook the books one place and not see it the other place with triple accounting that goes away. So these are just some examples. Now let me go into a few actual examples of uh, where, where it's used uh, today. Uh, Wire is, the, uh, as far as I know, the largest uh, crypto remittance uh, company in the United States. And it uh, it's, has its service in, in 30 countries now, where you can go uh, from and to fiat and then use crypto for the actual sending between border uh, over across borders. And they started out actually building their business uh, for helping small American companies pay their Chinese suppliers. And even back then, they were using Bitcoin as the settlement layer. That was still cheaper than using traditional bank transfers. So with it, now them using our DAI stablecoin, they don't have to think about any spread from the sending to the receipt and stuff like that, so they can offer their services uh, even cheaper to, uh, to their customers, which means them uh, competitive compared to, uh, to traditional uh, wire transfer services. Another example in, uh, in the supply chain area is TradeShift. How many of you know TradeShift? Ah, not a lot. It's, it's one of the largest supply chain payments and marketplace companies in the world. They have uh, 1.5 com million companies uh, in, their, in their network in 190 uh, countries. Uh, and really, they have one of the largest networks for this. And what we're collaborating with TradeShift about is the situation where you, as a small supplier, are delivering into big buyers because you have a, a lot of situations where you have big companies, they have lots of small suppliers. They demand 60 or 90 or perhaps even up to 180 days before they pay their invoices. And that really is a problem for small companies. No matter whether you look at, at Europe or the States or in individual countries, among the top three reasons why companies fail is lack of liquidity. So that is really a problem. And the thing is, the, um, the big banks, they don't really want small companies uh, finance, uh, to provide trade finance to small companies. It's, it's too expensive for them to risk evaluate the companies compared to what kind of volume they can generate. And if they, then can, they can choose to go to a factoring company and actually sell all the invoices for a discount, but the thing is, factoring companies also say it's all or nothing. We want all your invoices or we won't care about it. And what we are going, uh, doing together with TradeShift is actually offering a middle, uh, a middle way where the companies can say, take an individual invoice and say, I would like to have this one financed. And then 
What TradeShift does is it tokenizes the invoice, which means it suddenly becomes an asset on the blockchain. And then there is actually a new group of investors that are interested in going out and investing in, 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 the, in these invoices. This, one of the things is TradeShift through the network can actually provide a transaction history other information that actually makes it uh, a lot, uh, the risk evaluation of the individual invoice a lot better than what can be done traditionally. So that's, that's one way and the next step is actually to take a lot of invoices, bundle them into something that actually can be a well-described risk profile and that means we can also use tokenized invoice bundles as assets in our credit system. Okay, um, this example I'll just run over due to time. So let's dig a little bit deeper into how it works. Um, just first, let's re recapitulate uh, DAI. That's the first decentralized stablecoin Ethereum. Again, uh, it's soft pegged to the US dollar. It's kept, even though the cryptocurrencies has tanked with a round I would say 80% this year, it's kept this peg stable, and it's asset-backed. So it's like, there, it's not you have to believe in something, it's out there, locked up in smart contracts. You can always go in and see how much uh, there is to back the uh, die that is in circulation. It's programmable money, and as I said again, it's not like there's one single party that can go in and seize or uh, operation or shut something down because it is truly decentralized. Now, DAI is not the only stable coin. Actually, over the last three months, I think we almost had uh, a new stable coin coming every week. But the uh, types of stable coins uh, are not the same. So, uh, a little bit of theory here. There are in broad sense, three types of stable coins. The first is the stable coin where somebody says, we have as many dollars in a bank account, and then we issue IOUs against these dollars. And that is, there are, uh, there are uh, some, some currencies, one called Caesar, that, that uses this principle. And it actually it works quite well. It's easy to understand what's happening. You know, there's one dollar here and we have a token that is an IOU for one dollar. The only uh, consideration is, again, you have to trust that all these dollars exist in this bank account and you have to consider that, yeah, something may happen or somebody may, sh may seize this bank or whatever and that's, uh, that's a risk you have to consider. The next type of stablecoins called senior share is, uh, is just an algorithmic construct. So it's simply uh, somebody that says, we put out a token and says it has some value. And uh, if the demand, the larger demand, will issue more of that token. If the demand decreases, we'll also shrink the supply. And the consideration there is whether this algorithmic thing can act uh, in, in correct and sufficiently fast manner if there really is a fast shrinkage in demand. And then finally, there is the asset-backed stablecoin of which uh, DAI is, is, uh, is the, uh, more or less the only one. There is perhaps a couple of others, but we're certainly the, the major one where the, uh, the, the value of the of the stablecoin always is backed by assets. So let's dig a little deeper in what was on the left side of uh, my, my drawing in the initial flow of how it worked. What the, the user is creating is what we call a collateralized debt position, a CDP. And the trick is again, you always need to have more collateral on the left side than what you can issue on the right side. And again, depending on the type of collateral, how risky it is, there are different numbers for how much you need to over collateralize it. There will also be different values for what the stability fee you will pay 
to, to use a certain type of collateral will be, again, depending on the risk of that collateral. But otherwise, again, you deposit it, the price feed that comes from the real world determines always what the value is, and uh, based on that, you can generate buy. And the thing is, you're not giving up anything, you're just depositing it. So at any point in time, where you want to release your collateral, you just pay back the DAI together with a fee, and then you can, uh, can use your collateral as you wish. Now, to have, to go from, from what we call our beta version into what, what is a re real durable stable coin, what do we need? We need, obviously, to have diversification. So we need a lot of different types of collaterals that don't behave the same way uh, over time. So, and that can be, I already mentioned gold, uh, it could be, it could be uh, uh, stocks and shares that are tokenized. Really, it's just a, get, a question of getting a broad portfolio of potential collateral. And what all, always also must be the case is that the full system must be over collateralized. So there's always a certainty that uh, people can get their money back. And, what the ultimate proof in the potting is, is in case we get a major black swan event or we get an attack on the system, then we have what we call emergency shutdown. And that really is, okay, then we freeze the system and then according to the price feeds at that point in time, people can exchange their die for the underlying assets. And then they can keep their assets until we restart the system where we kind of fixed whatever brought this to a standstill, and then they can re-engage. Now, we don't think emergency shutdown ever will happen, but it's very important that we have tested it, that we have clear procedures for it, so it kind of it makes it clear for everybody that would like to attack the system that it's meaningless, because the only thing they will accomplish is that the system will be frozen. Um, so, I talked about the need for multi-collateral, and that means really being able to get real-world assets into the system, because that's still where all the value is, right? It's not in the crypto system, it's out there in the real world. So we want to get that into the blockchain, and that's through tokenization, where you actually are able to represent some kind of asset uh, through a digital token. And that also opens for new business models, for example, uh, in, in New York and Chicago, uh, there are property trades that are being handled through tokeni uh, tokenization, which means that actually small investors now suddenly can go in and get a position in the property market on Manhattan, something that wasn't possible before because they just, you know, you can exchange, you know, uh, one, one property on Manhattan into a, a million tokens, for example, and then suddenly it's, you know, possible to just buy a single token and and be exposed to, uh, to the property market on Manhattan. So what this really means is we are getting something that has been traded, marketed in different silos, in different countries and stuff like that. This is being put on a standardized representation on the blockchain, this token. That is just like what the shipping container, or it can be just like what the shipping container did for freight. You suddenly have a lot more, a lot easier way to handle it, have it been put on different exchanges, in, used in different applications, because it has the same interfaces in the digital world. Now, that also means that regulation really comes into play, because it, it's, it's important for us to always make sure that we adhere to, to local jurisdictions. So, there will have to be walled gardens where you trade these kind of tokenized assets and all the participants are KYC'd and all the rules are adhered to, where you do the switch from the real world assets into a security token, then some people can buy it, they can, cha can, can have it uh, traded uh, inside this walled garden, but they can also deposit it in this collateral debt position. And that, after that, draw the stable coin, which actually can be 
used outside the walled garden in the core system without, uh, without uh, any restrictions. So uh, that obviously, to kind of go full circle on that, we need a lot of partners. We need on-off ramps from fiat to, to, to die in, in the different areas. We need people to create these walled gardens uh, together with us in the beginning, but also from just uh, on their own. We need uh, people to buy, uh, to, to build additional applications, to solve regulation issues together with us and stuff like that. And uh, one example here of such a partner is, is Andreas and Horowitz, uh, which uh, decided to, uh, a couple of months ago to buy for 15 million of, of our governance token to take part in the governance of the system and also to help us approach uh, the American regulators. Katie Horn, who leads this fund, she used to work earlier for the American government. She was actually hired to close Bitcoin down, but then uh, she actually uh, uh, took a closer look and found out that cryptocurrency actually has a lot of value. So uh, just also a bit of numbers. Yesterday, uh, in this beta version of it, we have uh, 66.4 million US dollars in circulating supply. They are backed by uh, uh, 1.3 million ETH, which is actually more than 1% of all the ETH in the blockchain. And that's perhaps, if you're not into blockchain stuff and Ethereum, uh, that, that may not mean a lot to you, but that's a big deal. That actually means that, that we are uh, quite uh, uh, making an impact. So just there's some products. I also want to emphasize, you know, I hope this has triggered your imagination. I really encourage you to come and be join our Reddit or our chat or something like that. There's a lot of people there that also can help answer any additional questions and also take ideas from you. So please join the community, or if you want to build something with us, also you know approach us uh, for partnerships. So in the uh, in the end, again, the die credit system is decentralized. There is no counterparty. There is no single point of failure. Everybody can get access to this system, no matter whether you are a farmer in Africa that's unbanked, or whether you're a small business or this big enterprise. We're backed by real world assets uh, and assets, and it's, it's uh, transparent. Everybody can always see, actually you have, you have, in this case, you have access to all the books because you can go on the blockchain, you can see everything, you can see the state of the system at any point in time. And so far, we have almost a year where we just with one, single collateral has kept the peg to the dollar all the time. So with that, thank you very much. Um, when I bring collateral, uh, do I have a contract with the our organization or with the people that uh, take the collateral and uh, uh, for instance, if you have this, this invoice, I have this invoice brought and you said, well, and we bring it to investors who want to invest in this invoice. With who do I have a deal? With DAO in between or directly with the investors? You, you have, in this case, this invoicing thing is by handled initially by TradeShift. So what the relationship is to, to the DAI credit system is that there are, and that's a point that I, I didn't get to at all, the DAI system has a set of governors, that's the people that own governance tokens, that actually decide what kind of collateral you will accept in the system and what the risk parameters will be. So they will have to vote about, okay, we want to take bundled invoices into the system with these risk parameters. But then it's up to anybody that actually can offer such a collateral type to, uh, to to create it, and, and then you know anyone can actually deposit it up to a debt ceiling. Because again, we have debt ceilings, so we don't suddenly have our system exposed to one type of collateral for 90% of all, all there is in there. So that's one of the risk parameters. That's you know what debt ceiling do you want on the different collateral types? But this, is, there, is there someone who owns the collateral? Who is the one who, who sells it when I break the, the contract? The, but it, it's really the person that generates the die. They still own the collateral. Yeah, that's okay. We need the title on the collateral. Who, who can sell it when I break the con contract? Well, it, it will be it will be the uh, in in the case of the invoicing, 
it will be the supplier that has the invoice that can sell it to somebody that then, you know, they can pass the title and they can then tokenize it. So you as an organization were not in between, you were just no, infrastructure? No, not at all. We're just, we're just kind of participating in this to get this kicked off. Okay, thank you. Hi, and thank you for presenting. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, so if you have DAI stablecoin tied to the value of the dollar, is that what you said? Um, what happens when the dollar is devalued or if the dollar is devalued? Yeah, then, you know, the DAI follows the dollar. Uh, initially, the thought was to, to peg it to some consumer index and stuff like that. This may also happen in sometime in the far future, but it, we just, it was clear that for people to grasp this, we needed to peg it to some understandable unit. So yeah, if, if the dollar tanks, the DAI tanks. Now in the new system, we also have a concept of synthetic assets, which actually means that we'll also create DAI that's tied to Euro, DAI that's tied to, to, to the yen and, and so on. Uh, so, so you can choose where you want to have your exposure. Thank you very much for this very uh, inspiring uh, idea. Um, I have a question with respect to the collateral. Um, so you th uh, said that uh, over collateralization is, is needed. Uh, and if I look at the last slide, uh, circulating supply is 66 million US dollar. Um, and and uh, the market cap is 388. Does, does it mean that the overcollateralization can be deduced from that? No, no. Uh, and, that, and, that's again, that's perhaps okay. my, my mistake because that's the governance token, which I didn't really talk about. Yeah. That's, that's the market cap. That's the value of, of uh, what there is of, of governance tokens. So the system at this current state is about 240% overcollateralized. Okay. So, and, and if the, as, as far as I understand, Ether is, is one important collateral. Well, it's, it's the only collateral in the current instantiation. Early next year, we launch the real system where Ether still is one, but mm -hmm. then there will be like tokenized gold and, you know, hopefully soon, real uh, other tokenized real world assets. Okay, so, so let's assume that, that um, this collateral value in dollars will half in value. Mm -hmm. So is there an incentive for the creators of, of uh, the tokens to, to increase uh, afterwards the collateral so that the w system still works? Yeah, well, the thing is, the thing is if, if, if they kind of do nothing again, then the collateral will be sold off uh, on, on an auction and, and, you know, the system will cover its debt. So, and there, in the current system, there is a 13% penalty if that happens. So in that sense, uh, there is, there is uh, an, uh, also an incentive to actually make sure that your, your collateralized debt position stays healthy. So you mentioned that uh, you actually do settlements through smart contracts based on Ethereum, right? So when I do that, I have to pay for the gas price. Yes. So what happens when, the, when there is volatility with respect to gas? So does the customer has to pay for that increased gas? Yes, and, and that, that's, you know, you could say that's also part of the uh, uh, very, I wouldn't say, it's, it's, this is a young system. So what, what we'll see is actually that settlements will, we are already experimenting with that, settlements will happen on what we call side chains, where you're not, where you're actually transferring DAI to a, a chain where you're also paying the fees in DAI and, and they are, they are governed with something that's called proof of authority, so you don't have also all this energy spending to do the transactions. And there's, there's uh, you know, so it, it's really you only use the main Ethereum for the main co uh, collateralized debt positions, but all, all transactions and settlements, they can actually ha happen on scalability networks, payment channels, and so on. The thing is, we want to have DAI available on all, all relevant blockchains, because it's not like there's going to be only one and, uh, and uh, certainly some side chains uh, will have a lot of benefit. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. I think we should wrap it up here.